Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. You're so welcome. Uh, we're delighted uh, to be here this morning. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Margaret Conroy, and I'm Senior Librarian in Walkinstown Library. Uh, I have my colleague Anne Cairns here. I'm sure a lot of you know Anne from the library, so she's going to give me a jig out uh, if I miss anything on the way. She's going to keep an eye on me, you know. Uh, just have to say, absolutely thrilled and delighted that Cathy is joining us here this morning. Cathy is a real treasure and her, her love of local history is infectious. Uh, now, I was just saying, I met Cathy when I came to Walkinstown and she was doing some element of research for this particular talk. So uh, what she, we had such a great chat at that stage and it was my first time learning about the Brickworks. So I know you're in for a real treat this morning. So I'll mm -hmm. hand you over to Cathy now and enjoy. Lovely. Thank you very much, Margaret. And welcome, everybody. Uh, I must be doing something right if we can get this number on a, a, a Thursday in May uh, to come to a library talk. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. And um, as I say, thank you very much to Margaret and to Anne and the rest of the team in Walkinstown. Events like this don't just happen. They have to be called to happen. I'm very acutely aware of that. And I just want to say a huge thank you to them for agreeing to host. And it's an absolute pleasure to work with them. So if you just bear with me, I'm going to get the screen share up and we'll take it from there. OK, so again, thank you all for joining us and thanks to the team in Walkinstown. Just one moment now. Yep. Now, uh, Marcus, can you give me a thumbs up if that's all right? That's can perfect. Everybody... Yes, Cathy, you're perfect. Right. There. Okay, that's grand. So we have the screen up. The Dolphin's Barn Brickworks, a perfect marvel. That will become clear in a few moments. This has been an evolving story, uh, something a little bit close to my heart uh, because I'm from the Dolphins Barn area. But again, it was something I wasn't very aware of. And now that I am aware of it, it's one of those things you just can't unsee because it's all around us. So we work our way through the story of the Dolphins Barn Brickworks. And just to give you an idea of what's ahead of us, here we go. Um, the Dolphins Barn Brick Company, as it was called, a different, it had different names at different times. It was a significant local employer. In fact, quite a number of you probably have ancestors. If you were from this area, you probably had ancestors with some connection to the company at some time or other. The, um, the company chairman called it a perfect marvel and that comes up now and again in the story and uh, i suppose it's a it's a lovely little comment uh, and it's very reflective of the times as a company it provided the means to build our city and there's elements of dolphins barn all across dublin and again we'll touch on that as we work our way through it as a site it witnessed a revolution. In fact, it holds elements of a key part of the 1916 rising in particular, um, and maybe something you wouldn't have been fully aware of. There's lasting evidence of this company and the works all around our local landscape, stretching as far as Drimna, the Grand Canal, uh, down at Drimna, all the way through Crumlin, Dolphins Barn, right across to Kimmage, and all the places in between. And as I say, when I point them out to you, you'll never unsee them again. You know, they're there, and I'm just going to show you how they're existing, how we use them today. And like that, once they're seen, well, they can't be unseen. Uh, for those of you who've never seen a dolphin sparring brick, and I, I actually noticed somebody had a brick turning up for the top today, and I absolutely love that. It's on one of the screens there. Um, I have a few of them. Uh, they're dotted around the back garden and in the house itself, but that's a dolphin sparring brick. A distinctive yellow colour. Some of them have a deeper black colour to them, um, but they all have 
uh, the name dolphin sparn on it somewhere. Mainly this type with the frog in the middle with the words dolphin sparn impressed into it. But some of them are smooth with dolphin sparn on them. And then you find others with different initials, but they're the same company. So just to give you an idea of where we're going with the talk today. So here we go. The Dolphin Sparn Brick Company. Well, the evolutions and the fortunes of this company are indelibly linked to Victorian Dublin building improvements and the expansion of our city at the time. In an ultimate ironic twist, the demanding, uh, the, the demanding market forces underpinning the construction business was also to hold elements of the eventual demise of the brick company and uh, again like everything else there's always an irony in the story and you'll find out as we work our way through but, but let's go back to the beginning um, the company started in the late 1800s there was a huge emphasis uh, placed on residential house building in Dublin especially in the city area and in these new emerging suburbs that we had out in, and the townships in particular they're they're the driving force behind this the whole idea was to raise living standards in a city that had very poor living standards and um, consequently a number of these small independent brick manufacturers emerged um, all around the city outskirts because remember, the area we're talking about would have been the outskirts of the city at the time. Several were located in the general Dolphins Barn, Howes Cross, Kimmage area. Um, in 1892, the Donville estate sold some of the land that they had. They auctioned lands in the area. And it was noted when they were auctioning them that, and here was the quote, they believed to have an inexhaustible supply of brick clay from which its proximity to Dublin city gave this land great value. So you can see all the elements were there. The soil was suitable. The clay was suitable. It was near Dublin and the lands were up for auction. And here's the lands we're talking about. Now, this is before the brickworks example uh, actually started. And when you're looking at this particular map, you can quite clearly just about make out Dolphin's Barn there in the, in the middle of the screen. And what we're looking at there is the Grand Canal. So the area above the Grand Canal, that's the Crumlin Road. Roughly here would be where Mulberry Place is on my map. That's Loretta Crumlin, just if you're trying to get a, a, a location. And this is the Crossroads Old County Road and the Crumlin Road. So as you can see, this is rural County Dublin. This is a map about 1870. This is what it was like before it all kicked off as such. But back to the first uh, particular uh, brick company in question. And just to show you that the, there were different bricks and different companies. This is the Mount Argus brick, slightly different to our Dolphin's Barn because Mount Argus is actually raised on the brick. They're actually heavier than Dolphin's Barn brick and a slightly different color. Now, within five years of its existence, the Mount Argus Brickwork changed its name to the Dublin Brick and Tile Company. Their bricks were a kind of a grey yellow colour. There is a difference when you see them side by side and they have this stamp on them, Mount Argus. By 1902, their annual brick output was six million bricks per year. It was universally regarded as a business of big proportions. Jack Ryan, who was a resident in the general area, he described the scenes in the 1830s, in the 1930s. And this is the way he described it. Further in the dark lanes were galvanized huts on the right-hand side going towards Kimmage, in which two families lived. The huts faced the ramparts at Mount Argus, which was really hilly terrain. An old brickworks quarry with obsolete machinery was sited there. When the brickworks chimney was eventually taken down in the 1930s, it was actually demolished by Davy Frame and Company in Ring's End. So where was the Mount Argus brick quarried? Well, do we all know Eamon Camp Park in Sundrive Road? Do we know the running track in the middle of this park? 
that's the existence of the quarry today. The actual shape of the running track was created by the fact that there was a quarry there. So this beautiful park that we have in Sun Drive is actually the site of the old quarries for the Mount Argus Brick Company. The area was known as Rathland. This is the old townland. And in fact, you still find that in a couple of um, place names in the area. There's certainly a Rathland terrace running along. And this is the old map. You can see a couple of things here, the clay pits, the brick works. This is all part of um, the park today. There's the clay pits. Um, you see this place named Tongfield, where well, that will be more or less behind the stone boat pub in uh, Kimmage. There's a line of houses here. Uh, they're connected to the actual quarries of the time. And this is a fantastic aerial view that I managed to obtain. And what places it beautifully for us, of course, is the Mount Argus Monastery. You can see it there off to the right of the screen. The houses in question were located here, the ones that I had uh, on the image earlier. And um, in behind it, you can see that this at this time, this photograph was taken. The park has actually been uh, laid out as a park. Its days as a quarry are over at this time. But you get the impression of the big open area. And it's a fantastic area of photograph to have uh, to have obtained, especially as you can pick out those landmarks like Mount Argus in the picture. The houses that I was speaking about, these are those on the on Sundrive Road. Uh, these were the quarry workers' houses. Um, they were built particularly for people who were working in the quarry behind. In fact, one of them is slightly larger than the rest. That was for the manager. Uh, for the supervisor, he got a bigger house and the rest of them were for quarry workers. So this line of houses that we have on Sundrive Road, um, quite near the shops at Kimmage, um, they are... Uh, part of our story in the general area and a beautiful residential house today backing onto the park they would have backed onto the quarry and just to tell you what the dark lanes were like well this image most of you would probably recognize Loretta Crumlin in the background of the image this is when Sundrive Road was being widened to create Sundrive Road before that it was that little lane where the man is on the bike. That was the width of the dark lanes coming across from Loretta Crumlin, heading in the direction of Kimmage. And you can see how much land they took to widen the area to create Sun Drive Road. This is an image taken in the 1930s. Absolutely delighted to get that newspaper cutting of the time, just to set the scene for us. When Jack Ryan described the dark lanes, it was that little narrow lane he was describing. Now to get back to our other brickworks, these are the brickworks that eventually evolved on our original map. You remember our 1870 map? Now I have it in 1910. This is where the Dolphins Barn Brick Company uh, set up. Just up from Loretta Crumlin, just up from our little dark lanes on the Crumlin Road. You can see it very clearly there marked as brickworks on the map with its clay pits, its extensive clay pits of that particular time stretching out beyond it. This is without doubt the most famous and important brickworks that we had in the area. The manufacturing operations were conducted on this site on the Crumlin Road. It was previously Grove Field Farm. That was the name of the uh, original site. In fact, Grove Field Farm House is where Sun Drive Garda Station is today. Um, when the company uh, commenced business there, uh, originally these lands were, and um, this is a quote from the newspaper, saying they used as a feeding ground for a few cattle. So can you imagine cows on the Crumlin Road at this particular site? Hard to believe today, it's not that long ago, you know, it's only about 100 years ago that we're talking about. This brickworks was established in 1896 and the business continued until 1945 with mixed fortunes because think of the times from 1900 until 1945, Ireland was a difficult place to do business in. The directors of the company were John Good, who was a building contractor, 
a man called Alex Ward, who was the former director of the Aston Hall Brickworks in Britain, WJA Fox, and a man called J. Bud Doyle. They were directors of the Central Hotel in Exchequer Street in Dublin, but they also got involved in the brickworks here. Um, J. Bud Doyle was also a director of Todd Burns. Now, most of you probably know where Todd Burns were, but if you didn't, you do know the building. Pennies of Mary Street. That's where Todd Burns had their big shop. And so the director of that shop, when it was Todd Burns, was also a director of our Dolphins Barn Brickworks. The manager of the Brickworks were the Cassidy family. The Cassidy family had their house where the health centre is today on the Crum Road, and that was called Grovefield Villa. So it was connected to the whole original Grovefield farm. So the Cassidy family becomes important in our story as we work through. This is an original share issue notice for the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. And actually, this is the document I found that day up in Walkerstown Library. Uh, so, uh, if I had a big smile on my face that day, it's because I got a bit of a breakthrough. There's always a challenge when we're looking for information or trying to make a visual for a presentation to try. You wouldn't always get photographs that easily. So uh, finding something like this was really great an original document about share issues for the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. It performed exceptionally well. Uh, there's continuous reports in the newspapers of this company. Um, issuing stock, the stock is increasing in value, particularly in the early days. It was, it was really one of those important things to them. It grew extremely rapidly as a company in the early years. And growth in production was, of course, in line with growth in construction. So as the city was building, there was a demand for bricks. The demand for bricks increased the stock value, more shares were issued. Um, media reports, and you find it in the papers um, at different times, progress has been such as to necessitate some time back the duplication of the original plant. So they're, they're really um, a big, big company of its time. Um, and every time you duplicated your plant, you employed more people. So it became a very significant employer. It was once claimed that as far as brick making was concerned in the city neighbourhood, it would be in a position to supply any demand put on it at any time. So it was a confident company as well. 10% annual dividends were paid out. Um, sometimes it was 5%, sometimes it was 7%, but it was performing extremely well. And certainly between 1900 and 1912, it's up there one of the top companies in Dublin. Um, often you got reports as well saying the trading was up um, and the chairman on one occasion, and this is where we got the quote for the original slide at the beginning, he described the company as a perfect marvel. So it really was thriving, certainly in the first 20 years or thereabouts um, of business itself. I say one of the challenges is trying to get images when you're doing a presentation. And luckily enough, this is one out of the city archive. Now it's listed as sheds in Crumlin, but then elsewhere I found it as Crumlin Brickworks, which is another name that was applied to the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. And you can see that the nature of brick making meant that you had temporary buildings. You, you had buildings that you'd put a shed up and it could be removed then the following year, depending on the way you wanted to move your building around. But this is actually an image from the Crumlin Brickworks, the Dolphins Barn Brickworks. The Dolphins Barn Brick Company had a, a great business reputation. It was renowned for producing very good quality uh, bricks. That was the, the one thing it had to do, and, it's, and it did it very, very well. They were, as I described earlier, distinctive colour, this biscuit yellow colour. They had the frog in the middle. That was to accept the mortar. But in the frog, the words Dolphins Barn were there. So you find them... Uh, this is the way you can identify them very, very quickly. Later on, the words, uh, the letters DBC were imprinted in some of them, and that met, represented the company change to the Dublin Brick Company. And um, the class of brick was considered an 
ordinary building style. It's nothing out of the ordinary, but very, very similar in color and in texture to the old county Dublin bricks that had been used up to now. So that meant when extensions were being put on houses in the Leeson Street or Fitzwilliam Street and Gardner Street areas of Dublin, well, the ones they go for to match up would be the Dolphins Barn brick, the new brick that was being made. In fact, when the Jesuit residence in Gardner Street, which had originally been constructed at the County Dublin brick, when they were putting an extension on that um, in the early years, in the early 1900s, they went out and got Dolphins Barn brick to finish the job. They were a perfect match. They were selected for that particular reason itself. This is a little wall located on the Crumlin Road. Now, my long-suffering mother half is dispatched out to take many pictures. This is one he was sent for. He had to get this specific one. Because if you look at the brick with the corner cut off it, and you look at it carefully, you realise that brick is actually put in upside down on this wall because the letters are upside down. I might have a close up of it. I do because we turned the picture around. You see the DBC? That's the Dublin Brick Company. But the rest of the bricks in the uh, wall are the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. If that wall is ever knocked down accidentally by any traffic on the Crumlin Road, would someone please ring me? Because I'll be first on the scene. Um, this is an important wall. And it's something that we should be very proud of because that's one of the remnants hiding in plain sight made of our Dolphins Farm brick, but it also has these slightly rarer bricks included in it, the DBC bricks, which is that lovely little angle, and I only have one of them here in the house, so I'm not saying anything, but if one goes missing, uh, you might know where it is, uh, but that particular wall at Brickfield Drive is something that's a little bit special, and it really reflects what was going on in that general area. Um, for uh, you know, for a very very long time, an important part of our local history. And of course, where was the site? Well, today we all know it is the Crumb Shop Centre again. So probably going for redevelopment again in the in the not too distant future. But that was the exact location of the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. And I suppose the fact that the big site had been left there meant that in 1975, we could get a shopping centre put on the site. So to give you the exact location of the Dolphins Barn Brick Company, it's the Crumlin Shopping Centre on the Crumlin Road. But that wasn't the only lands that they had. Um, the land stretched a considerable distance behind the Crumlin Shopping Centre. And this is the rest of the map because I couldn't fit it all on the first screen. So in this map, I have brought you all the way from the Crumlin Shopping Centre to the Grand Canal on the other side of Drimna. Again, you can see more brickworks, all part of the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. And the reason for its location at the canal here the canal was used as a means of transport for bringing the bricks back down to the country. So Dolphins Barn bricks turn up all over the country, mainly transported along the Grand Canal system. So this location, uh, where the uh, canal meets Shore Road, more or less, today, uh, just around there was the rest of the brick company. And the area in between all of these fields at different times would have been used as clay, pit, uh, clay pits uh, for the company itself. This whole company is located perfectly. It's very close to Crumlin Village, which would have been a rural location at its time, and it was very near to the liberties of Dublin. And this gave it a big advantage because it could get local labour. It could get a lot of people locally to come and work in the company. It would have looked at the liberties as a source of cheap labour, in fact, uh, 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 for the company itself. Um, I got a no notification in 1903 that the company spent another £230 acquiring additional land, uh, selling at the same time 35 acres as uh, grazing land elsewhere within their complex. So they would move the field on and then buy another field and start excavating the clay from that. So you get a lot of variations in the maps as time goes on. 
but the clay pits that they used actually stretched in time from the Crumlin Road to Schlievenemann Road, the ivy grounds all around the Crumlin Road, all that side of the Crumlin Road itself. And as late as 1944, they were still digging the clay up in that general area. As a company, it's a huge employer. This is just one little section taken from the census records of 1901. I put in a simple uh, search brickworks and look at what I found. I mean, it went on for pages. Uh, here's, and you can see most of these people are living in the Dolphins Barn area and every one of them have a trade or a job in the brickworks itself. One person gives themselves as a clerk in the brickworks, that's uh, um, that lady, Margaret O'Neill, who's living in Eckland Street, but the rest of them are labourers in the brickworks. They're a huge employer. You can imagine the impact of all of these people walking up from Dolphins Barn every morning to go to work up in the Dolphins Barn brickworks, just above them, uh, or just beyond them in the canal area. They're all youngish men as well. Like their, their age range here is from about 40 down to 16. You know, young teenagers working on the bricks itself. Um, all its employers, employees were, were sourced locally. As I say, the Liberties, Dolphins Barn, Crumlin area. Tradition had it that the company had so many workers at this particular time, that when bricks were required for buildings on the Curra in Kildare, the story went locally. The men simply lined the route and handed a brick from one to the other until they got them down to the Curra. I'd say the true story was they put them all on the canal barge down the Drimna and let them go that way, but we won't get in the way of a good local story. There was a fire in Todd Burns as well around 1902. And there's a major collection taken in the Dolphins Barn Brickworks to help the employees of Todd Burns down in Mary Street. They shared a director. In fact, the uh, workers in the Dolphins Barn Brickworks contributed five pounds towards the collection for the staff who worked in Todd Burns at the time. 1904, they had a trade float in the Gaelic League Irish language procession through Dublin, commemorating the Dolphins Barn Brickworks. It's said that the employees earned a decent wage. You know, it wasn't a place where you went and you were underpaid. People were quite happy with what they earned. Expenditure on labour in 1904 amounted to over £7,000, which is a considerable sum of money for the time. The majority of employees were adult males, and most of them earned an average about a pound, but up to two pounds every week. Women were also employed, and I can prove that actually by my next slide, because here is the census return of um, a family who are living in Mead Place in 1911, and you can see both the mother and a daughter are working in brick making in this one family in the Liberties. And there's plenty more to be found if you do a search on the, uh, the records, the, the census records. Their working clothes were quite interesting. There were sack aprons and wooden clogs. So health and safety, yes, certainly is there. So if you dropped a brick on your foot, your wooden clog would help, uh, would prevent injury. As the various processes of brick making called for no special technical skill, it was a pretty quick uh, way of actually learning how to do it. Um, so pay was considered fair. Uh, girls earned about nine shillings to ten shillings, considerably less than the men, but somehow it seemed okay for the times. Boys got nine to twelve shillings. Um, in addition to the direct employment, there's 120 carters also employed to transport the bricks around the country and around the network. There was even a little train system running within the whole complex to move clay from the clay pits into the kilns. The work, though, could be hazardous. I found a newspaper report, again, in Walkerstown Library from 1906. And here we found that Patrick O'Connor of Tenters Lane in Cork Street, a brickworks employee, suffered a fractured skull 
when uh, stooping under belting to scrape out ashes and the heavy machinery collapsed down on top of them. So you would find these little incidents uh, mentioned now and again. If we look at what was going on, what was using the bricks at the time, 1903, the Leinster paper mills in Clondalkin, St. Peter's Church in Fibsborough, and the O'Connell School in Richmond Road all put in orders for Dolphins Brick for their building purposes. By 1904, the output was 8 million bricks a year, and they were being used all over Dublin and its suburbs. Guinness Trust buildings used them. They are the buildings down on Patrick Street. Also, we find them in the Black Rock Cottage Scheme in County Dublin. Parkview Cottages, which were located opposite the main entrance into the South Dublin Union, James's Hospital in James Street, they were built with the bricks. And also the Black Rock Township Post Office, a key building in Black Rock Village, even today, that was constructed with Dolphins Bar Brick. What could possibly go wrong? Things are going so well, you know that there's going to be a, a change. There has to be. So after the rapid growth of the early years, by 1912, this is where we start to change the business because suddenly there's a bit of a slump. This is when the Mount Argus Brick Company and the Dolphins Barn Brick Company amalgamate. And this is where we get the name changed to the Dublin Brick company. They're also combining with the Rat New Brick Company in County Wicklow. And the whole entity was being called the Dublin Brick Company, but they retained one name and the one name they retained within the brick manufacturing was that of Dolphins Barn. So that's how we have many more Dolphins Barn bricks than we have of the rarer Mount Argus bricks. Uh, bringing Black Rock into the story a little bit. You, this is a picture of uh, Black Rock Village. I got this from um, a, an online collection. Um, but if you look really closely on the right hand side of the image there, you'll just about make out the name Wallace Coal Company in Black Rock Village. And the reason I have that there is that the three brothers who ran that company, uh, Hugh Jackson and Norman Wallace, they become directors of our Dolphins Barn Brick Company. Think about it for a minute. What do you need to fire a kiln? You need coal. And these were the coal suppliers for the Dolphins Barn Brick Company to actually fire the bricks. So it was a, a natural link between being a coal merchant and being a brick maker. And in addition, the Wallace brothers were builders providers. So it was a continuous link from the coal to the brick and back to being a builder providers themselves. The whole area around Dolphins Barn though shows a bit of a decline at this time. So there's obviously difficulties in our economy. I found a fantastic um, note in the Irish Times from 1914, reporting that the road outside the brickworks uh, and um, to the tram lines at Dolphins Barn. So we're talking about the that part of the Crumlin Road from the brickworks down into Dolphins Barn Village. And the quote from the Irish Times was, the road is in a deplorable state. So you can imagine it was being churned up by the movement of bricks in and out of the site. Despite a few large stones being thrown into the larger holes that existed in the roadway uh, at the Christmas time to try and improve it a little bit, a gentleman from Nace in County Kildare, Lieutenant Colonel St. Lawrence Moore, he noted to, in a letter to the Irish Times that he expected his vehicle springs to give way any moment now when he was traveling down that particular stretch of the Crumlin Road outside the Dolphins Barn Brickworks. Not a good look, I'm sure you'll agree, but you know, uh, potholes is something we've all lived with at different times. 
I mentioned that uh, a family called Cassidy were heavily involved in the uh, brickworks. In fact, they were the managers. This is a, a an extract from the Tom's directory. If you look at it carefully, you can just about make out Peter Cassidy's name there, living in Grovefield House. It also went by Grovefield Villa. And then elsewhere on this, we have the, uh, the Dolphus Barn Brick Company mentioned there, Dolphus Barn Brick and Tile Company. And you see here, manager, Peter Cassidy. I have a reason for mentioning this because we're moving forward in time. And this is actually where our brick company becomes a witness to the revolution. In fact, it becomes key to the 1916 rising. And the reason it's key to the 1916 rising is in the build up to the rising, James Connolly went missing for three days. There's numerous accounts of it. He leaves Liberty Hall one day and nobody knows where he is for three days. He goes missing completely. Now, I went digging to see if I could find out a little bit more about this. And it turns out that members of the military council who were planning the rising for 1916, I won't say kidnapped James Connolly, but let's say he, they brought him away to have a discussion with him for three days. The place he was brought to was Grovefield House on the Crumlin Road, the home of the manager of the Brickworks Company. And he was held in the Brickworks for three days as they worked out how Connolly and his citizens' army would be part of the 1916 Rising. And that is a huge turning point in the planning of the rising itself. And that is our key part to the rising in the Dolphins Barn Brickworks. The location, some places, some references you find is that he was brought to a house in Lucan, but most of them tell us he's brought to a house in the Dolphins Barn area. And then you find in one or two of the witness statements he's brought to the brickworks in Dolphins Barn. It turns out that the Cassidys were members of the IRB. They're the managers of the brick company and they are connected with the revolution and the whole setup and um, arrangements for the 1916 rising. So we have within our brick company the site where it all changed and James Connolly becomes directly involved in the 1916 Rising and everything about it. Speaking of witness statements, you find loads of them. I mean, I've just put a small section up on the screen here and they're telling us about arms dumps that the um, brickworks were being used to hide arms in it. Part of the brickworks were colloquially known as cavernous hills. And you find that reference as well, where they were training in the undulating clay pits. They could hide there near enough to a main road for getting in and out, but could be hidden by the fact that there was mounds of clay. Different, the whole landscape lended itself to actually training and drilling. The Fina boys trained in the area as well. Um, they used it, as I say, for arms dumps. They used it for training. They used it, um, there's a reference, actually, Christopher Burns reference, mentioning um, the manager was Mr. Cassidy, who, although Scotch, was very sympathetic and helpful to us. So you find lots of references in the witness statements. There's a whole chunk of research that could be done on the witness statements alone and the connections with the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. As I say, these are just a selection of some of the ones I found as I was preparing to put the talk together. It had been used for training by the Fianna boys. Then it's used extensively during the rising, um, as I say, for storing things, uh, for training, for drilling, and also that connection with James Connolly all through the rising itself. But behind all of this, work went on. And this is an example of some of the houses locally that were being built during our troubled times. These are the houses down on James's Walk, down near the back of Guinness's built with Dolphins Barn Brick. 
Ironically, these houses are actually called after people closely involved in the rising. So you get Colbert's Fort, you get Clark Terrace, you get Mallon Avenue, all people who were directly involved in the rising. And these houses were built about a year and a half after the 1916 rising itself. We also get extensive incidents in the area all through the War of Independence. This is just one account um, in the build up to the burning of the halfway house up in uh, Walkinstown. And here they say that they collected, um, they, they actually hijacked military trucks outside the brickworks on the Crumlin Road. The Crumlin Road was the main route out to Baldonnell. This was the route being used to bring British forces into the city all throughout the War of Independence. And it was a natural place where people could actually stop um, and they, they found it very easy to hijack the the lorries outside the brickworks themselves. So again, these are all uh, trucks that were hijacked in the area, a whole build up to the incident at Walkinstown, which is a whole other story for another talk, for another night, um, but basically all kind tied up in our revolution and the brickworks is our landmark along the route. As I say, house building continued. And these are the houses in Cant Fort in Mount Brown, again built using Dolphin's Barn Brick. This is an image you won't get today because the children's hospital is going in exactly where those trees are at the moment. Um, but can you just about make out the houses in the background and their beautiful yellow brick uh, in the upper reaches, a mixture of granite and yellow brick used to build the houses in Cant Fort. And again, every single one of the roads in that area are called after a volunteer who lost his life in the South Dublin Union James's Hospital during the 1916 Rising. So another connection back to the Rising and our revolutionary times. Another image of them here, you can see very clearly that lovely speckled mixture of black and yellow that the Dolphins Barn Brick give you and how enduring a building material it is. And the Camfort houses are a lovely example of how the houses could be built using Dolphins Barn Brick. Also taking place at this time were all the developments in and around the tenter. So we're now moving into the Civil War years. This is the Civil War and heading into the Free State. We're becoming very aware of our Indigenous industries and how are we going to support them. So you find the Dolphins Barn Brick used as a material for the rear of the houses in the area and you also see granite used in the windowsills and above the windows. That's to keep the stonemasons in work in the quarries in the Dublin Hills. Uh, Sanford Avenue is a really good example of bricks in the back of the houses. There, Dolphins Barn Brick in the back of the houses with red brick, the uh, uh, Port Marnock brick being more popular for the front of the houses themselves. But Merton Avenue, again, you see it in the gable. There's Dolphins Barn in Merton Avenue. You can pretty much pick them out. As I say, once you, you see one, you start seeing it everywhere. You can work it out very, very well. But the key one was in the first years of the Free State, the big development that took place in the tenters in Fairbrothers Fields. Ultimately, I think an order for nearly 12 million bricks goes into the Dolphins Barn Brick Company to build the houses in and around the tenters themselves. They are key to the whole story of the area and of the Dolphins Barn Brick Company itself. Um, the idea, buy your brick locally, keep men in work, build houses for the people. These are the foundations of the Free State and they're being used, uh, built using our Dolphins Barn Brick. Ebenezer Terrace is another great example. This is made famous more recently by the Mrs Higgins ad with Woody's at Christmas time that was filmed down in Ebenezer Terrace. But if you look closely, you can see elements of the Dolphins Barn Brick, even in the Woody's ad at Christmas, but the, the cottages along there at Ebenezer Terrace are absolutely beautiful. Again, Dolphins Barn Brick used in building them. And this is another element of the tenters behind those facades, Dolphins Barn Brick. 
um, used extensively. And I think I have one more. Yeah, I have this great image, particularly good, down around Clarence Mangan Road as you're heading down into Black Pits. If you look at the houses there very closely, you can again make out the Dolphus Barn brick used in them. This is the, a fantastic example of using the brick in the early years of the Free State. And again, if you think of the way we think green, these bricks didn't have far to travel. They were only coming from the Cronin Road um, just over the bridge down to the tenters to build the house. So everything, it ticked every single box you could possibly think of. I have a lovely, lovely description um, of the, uh, the kilns in Dolphin's Barn. And it actually comes from a little diary that I found as part of the Loretto archive. So we all know Loretto Crumlin on the Crumlin Road, opened in 1930. And a young nun who was brought to the new convent gave us an insight of what it was like to look out the windows of the new convent as it opened up on the Crumlin Road. Here's our description. Beyond Herbert Lane, an extensive area was occupied by the buildings and lands of the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. At night, the eerie glow from the kilns would light up the sky for miles around. Now, the kilns are long gone, but the best example of kilns I could find were the ones out on the Blessington Road. And again, thankfully, John's a biker. He didn't mind getting the boots muddy. He had to go across a field to get this picture for me. This is the old kilns of the Blessington Brickworks out near Kilbride. And this is what I imagine the kilns that Sister Evangeline is describing in her image from Loretta Crumlin. This is what they must have looked like on the Crumlin Road. Inside, again, John was inside the kiln. If you look up, you can just about make out breaks in the roof because it had to let the steam from the bricks escape through the roof of the kiln. So you would have had an eerie glow at night as the kilns were firing, and then you would have steam rising out at the top as the bricks were drying on racks within. So this is what the interior of a kiln um, would have looked like. Another little uh, interesting comment that I found when I was researching, Eamon McTomosh in his book, Medjool and Darl in Dublin, he illustrates uh, how attractive the geography of the brickworks were for school children in the 1930s, particularly if they, they were scheduling an unscheduled day off school. And he quotes in his book, they can't have their school bags, we hide them in the robber's den. Or what about the tunnels in the brickworks? I know. The last time we hit them there, we couldn't remember what tunnel we put them in. So even Eamon McTomosh describes it as being a magnet for children to play in. Much of the area in the 1930s was still rural, as Sister Evangeline showed us. And again, we found references in the newspaper to the brick company advertising grazing land um, for 11 months in February in the 1930s found another reference to a brick uh, worker uh, being injured in the works uh, when owing to heavy rains there was a fall of sodden clay. It resulted in a man called Thomas Kirwan, who was 50, from Maracone, being taken to hospital with head and hip injuries. So, you know, it had its hazards, it had, it was subject, it was open air, out in the elements, but, you know, these things would happen. How about that for another newspaper clipping? Here we have them on picket duty outside the Dolphins Barn Brick Company, the time they went on strike. 1933, a huge strike took place in the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. 90 workers went out, left their jobs. They only reopened the brick company in October. It went on from July to October. And only after extensive meetings took place in the Connolly Hall 
in Thomas Street. So you can imagine, you see even the guards are on duty on this particular one, watching the picket line. And again, you can see there's a woman in the picture, women as well as men were employed by the brick company in Dublin. However, the brick company did um, expect an expansion in work through the 30s. We're beginning to pick up a wee bit. And they also, after the strike, said they were going to increase their workforce. Um, because the Free State was now proposing huge housing schemes in the city. But it was also in dispute with the corporation about the cost of the bricks. Um, they were, at the time, the corporation were building flats in town. These ones, Cook Street in Dublin. The corporation puts in an order with both Dolphins Barn and Cork Town Brick Company for these bricks. So the red ones are the Cork Town and the yellow ones are Dolphins Barn. They had to have a commission of inquiry into the cost of the bricks. Nothing ever runs smoothly. We often have commission of inquiry. And it emerged that the Dolphins Barn Brick Company was charging 57 shillings and sixpence per 1,000 bricks, but offered no reduction to the corporation, despite the fact that two million bricks were ordered for this construction. When the inquiry was taking place and the uh, brick company was contacted about the discount, the company said it's more likely to see a rise in brick costs rather than any reduction because there's a big demand for our products at the moment. So uh, things were not going that smoothly. They haven't got a great relationship with the corporation. But look at how well the bricks have stood. Beautiful buildings, um, the flats down in Cook Street. At this time, they're employing 140. They're making 9 million bricks a year. They've recently acquired another 28 acres of land. Um, and they estimate the brick company could last for another 40 years. There's enough clay on the site to work for 40 years. But then, towards the end of the 30s, we're heading into World War I and the or World War II and the depression that came with that. The works were closed for several months and 100, 100 workers were let off uh, work. It also diversified into concrete products. Um, this is an aerial view of the site in the 19, early 1940s. You might just about make out Loretta Crumlin in the bottom left-hand uh, corner there. So this is Old County Road, this is Crumlin Road, and there's the site. And at this stage, it's diversifying. It's moving from just making bricks. There's all the brick clay uh, clay being dug out in the distance, but it's diversifying into concrete products. And they also set up a little branch of the company called Concrete Products of Ireland, and its headquarters are in the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. Um, they're beginning to make concrete bricks and concrete tiles. And those, the quote on their ad was, those using this material are more than satisfied with the result. And here's an ad for some houses that were being built at the time on Moby Road in Glasnevin. And you can see there Concrete Products of Ireland with their Dublin works at Dolphins Barn. And they're the houses that were being built with a mixture of concrete products and the bricks being used then as a, a decorative rather than the main reason for building. So the Moby Road scheme is a very good example of one of the bigger building schemes going on. But at the same time, they were also building the Regal Ballroom at Hawkins Street and also um, mixing up some of the old county bricks with the Dolphins Barn brick. Um, they, they built they used the, the bricks left over from part of the old theatre royals. So they were using them for other, uh, they, they added to them. The, uh, the tram company put in a new transformer in Hatch Street, again, built using Dolphins Farm brick. Um, there was partition walls put up for Fry and Company, again, using the bricks. Mullingar Cathedral even used Dolphins Farm bricks when it, uh, they were ex extending down there, and also the extension to Whitefriar Street School in Dublin, behind Whitefriar Street uh, Church, again, was using Dolphins Farm bricks. So there was bits of them 
strolling up all over the city. And here comes our ironic twist. After World War II, or the emergency, it was called here, the Dublin Corporation announces that it's going to extend the suburbs of Dublin. And believe it or not, this is where a brick company finds itself opposing building in a huge ironic twist because the corporation proposed the 895 100,000 Drimna housing scheme. But in order to build Drimna, it needed to take the land off the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. The company pleaded with them not to do it because they said if the scheme goes ahead, there'd be nothing left of the brickworks except one kiln and a few offices. It would cost over £40,000 to relocate the works. And the company asked the corporation to guarantee that they didn't intend putting them out of business. But within five years of the announcement of the proposal to go ahead with Drimna, another thing happened. Mr. Good had been the chairman of the brick company all through this time, and he passed away. So they lost their chairperson. And then I discovered an ad for Hamilton and Hamilton auctioneers advertising that the Dublin Brick Company, having ceased production, wished to auction the entire equipment, including its killing flues and its railway sleepers. As a finale, the final buildings to be built using Dolphins Barn Brick are this mid-terrace of houses in the Drimna housing scheme. They're located on Morn Road, and they are the last houses to be built using Dolphins Barn Brick. Most of the Drimna scheme covered most of the Brickworks land, and the Brickworks ceased production. There's another view of them. Um, you can see you can, you can see them quite easily that they are Dolphins Barn Brick. However, it wasn't quite the end. This is a map more or less contemporary with Drimna being built. You can make out some of the uh, houses there of Keeper Road, in fact, being built. And a refuse tip at the top of Keeper Road, that's actually where the park um, evolved afterwards. Clay pit is disused in this image, but there is the Morocrete works. The concrete element of the brick company managed to survive a little longer. They manufactured concrete blocks, paving slabs and pipes. They were very well known for those big, big concrete pipes. And they remained on the site there until the 1970s. Um, the name came from Moran Concrete, Moracrete. Um, they built a number of houses for their workers too. Um, they also made paving slabs. This is an example down in Nassau Street. And conveniently for me, they put the word Maracrete in on quite a number of them. Here's a close up. You find these under your feet if you, if you look carefully. These are around the back of Trinity. They built, as I say, the houses for their workers. So these are the early ones that were put up in 1936. There was more built a little bit further up the Crumlin Road in, 19, in the 1950s. These were the houses they built for their workers on the Crumlin Road. The final link with the brickwork ceased when Morrow Creek closed. The site was cleared, and as we know, the Crumlin Shopping Centre was built on the site and opened in 1975. Now, what other little buildings, just to give you an idea of key buildings uh, before we finish up, that we know that are Dolphins Barn Brick. The most famous in the Dolphins Barn area is the Flair Wills building. I got this out of the Irish Blood Transfusion Photographic Archive, believe it or not. One of the days they went down to take blood from the workers <laughs> in the, um, the cigarette factory. But that is built with Dolphins Barn Brick. A couple of more images of it. This is a day that they were going out to the... Um, St. Patrick's Day Parade, 
and they have their float outside, but the, the building behind you is Dolphin's Barn Brick and a more recent one, again, there it is, taken from St. Anne's Road, looking across at uh, the Clearwoods factory on the Cronin Road. But another one, a little bit closer to the library, is the beautiful St. Mary's Church in Crumlin Village. And these are the actual plans for it. This won a silver medal in 1944, came second in an architectural design um, of the time. And the whole building inside and out is Dolphin's Barn brick. It's stunning. It's when you look at it and the lines of the building, the style of the building, it's quite outstanding. And it's all Dolphus Barn Brick. And here's a close up of the front of it. And to take those beautiful details, the door at the front and the window above, there they are. Absolutely beautiful. And that is the best example we have of a classical award winning building with Dolphins Barn Brick. And when you look at them closely, I've been around the building a few times, some of them are leaching. You know, you can see um, the bricks are weathering, but they weather beautifully and they sit perfectly in their landscape. Another one is uh, the old Caesar shop that existed at Dolphins Barn. There it is in 1970 on the left-hand side, the black and white one. It was demolished and the rubble was Dolphins Barn Brick, and all that remains of it today is that chimney stack going off up into the air. That's Dolphins Barn Brick. How that has survived the storms, I don't know, but it's still there. So again, every time you see that chimney stack, think of the Barn Brick. It's there for all to see. A good example of Morocrete is the wall around Loretto Crumlin. They're the Morocrete blocks. But you see them on garden walls all over the area. Again, a brilliant example of material being sourced locally and used locally. The wall around Loretta Crumlin is all Morocrete. Only had to come from across the road where the Crumlin Shopping Centre was for the delivery of the blocks. They were certainly going to arrive on time, no doubt about it. And then, of course, the things that we have, the place names we have associated with our brickworks. Brickfield Drive is the most obvious one off the Crumlin Road. There's a Brickfield House and, of course, the Morocrete cottages themselves on the Crumlin Road. The bricks are hugely popular. Uh, they are quite expensive now to get. A block of them would probably be in the region of 500 euro. Um, and they're used for interior architectural design. Now you find people getting the archway of their kitchen done. You find them for garden ornaments and you find them in Max Salvage and in the various salvage places. Hugely, hugely popular brick. Very difficult to get the Mount Argus brick. They are a little bit more special, but the Dolphins Barn brick, yes, are very, very popular for garden design, for interior design. And this is the way you see them even today, stacked up. This is Max Salvage down in Kilmainham. And on one or two occasions, as historian residents, I've been asked to do really weird things. And this was a project we were doing for the National College of Art and Design in Thomas Street. They were trying to recreate the bricks. Where will we find the brick uh, clay? So myself and another colleague, that's me on the right, trying to find clay beside the Lewis line <laughs> down on the old canal. And we did. We found a little bit of brick clay and they fired it in the kilns in the National College of Art and Design. They were trying to make uh, swift boxes to go up in the Liberties of Dublin and wanted to source the clay locally. Um, I wouldn't recommend digging up the Lewis line too often. You can imagine some of the comments we were getting while we were there, digging up little bits, seeing because we were doing soil samples. So anything is possible. These things can go anywhere. But let's say, yes, certainly, the Dolphins Barn Brick Company, it was a perfect marvel. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed that talk. Thank you. Thanks, Mill. Cathy, uh, I'll hand you over to Anne now and she'll go through some of the questions. 
Sorry, Anne, you're on mute there. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Wasn't that just super? All those little uh, stories and behind all the information. Really, really interesting. I really had a lovely time listening. And my grandparents, um, they lived on the Sun Drive Road. And like that, I would have seen the wall in the Loretta College, so it's it's really all bringing it back to me and fond memory. So thank you, Kathy, for that. Uh, just one or two questions I have, uh, Kathy, uh, from Michael Moore. Uh, were these bricks composite bricks or made of clay? And if so, were they fired in a kiln? And I think he also wants to know where was the kiln. Yeah, that's a good question. The kiln was located on the Crumlin Road. You might have spotted it on one or two of the maps. It actually showed the words brick kiln. So roughly where the Crumlin Shopping Centre was, and that would equate to uh, the nuns spotting it from the convent in, in Crumlin. Um, they were originally all handmade bricks, so made like you would, you know, um, pottery if you like handmade I do think they were they wandered into machine bricks at a later date because the brick changes from the frog in the brick from the the hollow uh, to a flatter brick um, and I've seen the flatter ones with just the words Jonathan's barn on it but mainly handmade bricks I think that's what makes them a little bit more special as well you know um, that they're locally handmade and made by local people which is uh, another little element as well great question though yeah fair play very special uh, thank you Michael another question any idea why it's called Dolphin's Barn instead of Crumlin Brick Company very good yes and of course we know the area as Crumlin today. Um, we possibly might refer to it as Drimna nearly because the Drimna estate is behind it. But you've got to remember that when the lands were laid out originally, the canal did not exist. So the area of Dolphins Barn went from Dolphins Barn village almost as far as um, where uh, the Crumlin College is on the Crumlin Road. They they were the lands of Dolphins Barn. They stretched out that far. That's how you have Loretta Crumlin, the original house there. Uh, it was originally called Mulberry Place, but later called Carn Cluck House. And Carn and Cluck is the Gaelic uh, name for the area for Dolphins Barn. So the old area of Dolphins Barn goes that far. And even the current parish takes in Brickfield Drive as part of Dolphins Barn Parish. So it predates the canal. So you've got to take the canal out of your um, mind, if you like, when you're defining areas. And that's why it was called the Dolphins Barn Brick Company, because it was actually in the area of Dolphins Barn. Gotcha. That's very informative. <laughs> uh, one more question now from Thomas Lawler. Uh, he says, thank you, he's enjoying the... Uh, the event. Are any of the company records available that might show the carters and the contractors employed? So any records of... No, it, it was a challenge to find information on the brick company. It was quite a challenge. Um, but I do know one of the contractors was Richardson's. And Richardson's were located on Herberton Road um, it would have been called Herbert and Lane at the time. They were also the carters for Guinnesses. Um, and they seemed to contract out for a lot of the uh, bigger companies in the area. So Richardson's is certainly one of the companies. Um, so much a question uh, about your talk this morning, more about um, what is behind you that people are very interested in. <laughs> the lovely possibly behind you, Cathy. And that is my wall dresser. My wall dresser, can you see it? Beautiful. It's, they're all very impressed and they want to know, have you been doing your own clay work? Oh no, oh no, I haven't, I haven't got into, no, no, I can't. Not yet. I can't clay them, no, but I do love pottery. Um, no, but I haven't, no, they're not mine. Uh, I love dressers, so um, we, we filled the kitchen up with dressers and that's my wall dresser behind me. So yeah, well spotted everybody. So I'm, I'm in the kitchen because this is where the best Wi-Fi in the house is. So uh, <laughs> you got to go where you got to go. <laughs> go where it is, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, just one more question. Any guess uh, or reason why Brick Company manufactured yellow brick 
locally uh, around 1870. Okay, yellow brick. The colour of the brick comes from the consistency of the clay that was actually um, gathered in the area. So the colour is different for what the clay they got in the quarry in Mount Argus, the, the quarry where Sun Drive Park is today. It was slightly different. It was actually yellower. Uh, whereas the barn brick was, um, you got this mixture of sort of a biscuit yellow and a black occasionally, a, a sort of a black fleck through it. So wherever they got the clay, that determined the colour of the brick. And the yellow bricks were kind of associated with the old County Dublin brick. But the red brick became very fashionable and that was actually um, fired out in Port Marnock. So they would face off the buildings with the red brick and then the yellow brick was used internally or out the back or for back gables. Um, yeah. You know, it varied. And I suppose like our, our tastes changed and fashions changed, but it was all to do with the, the clay colour. And you saw the piece of clay that was held up in nearly the final slide, that kind of dirty brown colour when it's fired that goes yellow so uh, it's all to do with the processes of firing it as well very good very good and uh, somebody wants to know uh Aoife horn wants to know was the brickworks involved in the strike and lockout of 1913 that's a good question and i couldn't find any evidence of that but i'm suspecting by the fact that i found references to they were going through a difficult time at that stage because that's when they were um uh, you know, they mentioned the amalgamation of the two brickworks and they join up with Rathnew. So it looks like it was a pretty awful time around 1912, 1913. I'd imagine that's connected to the lockout, but it was the connection wasn't directly made um, that yeah. it was to do with it. Look, it's open to more research. These are ongoing things. I'm constantly looking for new information. The talk I gave today is completely different to a brickwork talk I would have given five years ago because I found more and more stuff as I'm going on and I keep updating um, my records and my information all the time. Um, I'm fascinated by the area we live in. I mean, Dublin 12, Dublin 8 is an amazing part of Dublin. Absolutely amazing. And there's so many untold stories. And I, I'm like a woman on a mission at the moment, trying to get <laughs> them all up, you know, and put them together. But no, I couldn't find a direct link, but I suspect yeah. this times had an effect on the company. And that is certainly a huge change when they join up with Rathnew and the Mount Argus and the Dolphus Barn all come together under the umbrella Dublin Brick Company, but the only logo they retained on their brick was the Dolphins Barn Brick. So Very good. I can hear the enthusiasm. You're, you're just super. <laughs> you really are. Can I just say one more little thing here? Uh, somebody's complimenting you. Uh, another excellent presentation. I grew up in Esposito Road, so that's not miles from us. Just down from the library. And my family came from uh, Kent Court, uh, so there's a lovely link there. She yeah. passed Crumlin Road while attending school. So very familiar with the, the locations. And of course, uh, like St. Mary's Church in Crumlin. And she's just delighted to be able to have you know, heard all of yeah. this again. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, everything, there are things hiding in plain sight, like that lady mentioned there, didn't catch her name. Um, uh, oh, uh, Ita, Ita, uh, so, like Aoife mentioned, you pass these things every day. Yes. You don't know what you're looking at. You know, there's a much bigger story to tell. And you piece it all together then and capture it under a story about a company that was an employer on the Crumlin Road and in Kimmage and in Drimna and put it all together. Um, and that's what I love because there's remnants of this world all around us. And you look at it completely differently when you know the story behind it. Um, yeah. You really, really do. And you have a whole new respect for it. And uh, and the, the efforts, I mean, this company existed up to the 1940s. They were the toughest times in Ireland. We were an independent nation heading out on our own, having left the empire behind. And look what we built. And we, we made the bricks locally. We employed people locally. We built houses. 
for people. We built schools, we built churches, we built like, you know, Mullingar Cathedral, extensions of schools on Whitefriars Street, St. Mary's in Crumlin Village. They, these were all built um, when Ireland really hadn't got very much. So it, it's something to be kind of really, really proud of. But the foundations of the state we live in now, um, and they're built on local product and made locally by local people. And the sense of pride in that, that's something really to be proud of. I think, will we wrap it up there, Anne? That's, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to say again, going back, Cathy, you know, your enthusiasm is infectious. Uh, the last talk I attended on the Poddle, as you know, I took the runners out and off I went on the Saturday and every nook and cranny was explored and I'm on the same mission now this weekend, please God. So, and the day that's in it, uh, I think everybody should do the same. You actually bring the whole thing live, history live on our doorstep and it's out there for us to explore. So thanks so much. I just want to say as uh, Cathy's role historian in residence for other talks uh, that Cathy and her colleagues will be giving in Dublin City Council, if you go on to your Facebook page, Cathy, isn't that right? right yeah. uh, you'll get information. I know you're given the talk in Puddle Park to do with Harold's Cross Festival and then the commemoration talks also are coming up, isn't that right? That's and you're right, doing yeah. those. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's absolutely fantastic. And then just from our own point of view, just to say that we got fantastic news during the week in that we are now going to be open next Monday for a browse and borrow facility. So thank goodness it's been a long haul for us all. Uh, can't wait to see you all. So just to say a uh, late on Monday from one until eight and then Tuesday to Saturday, 10 until. So information to do with our offence is all up on Facebook. We also have a new newsletter for Walkenstown Library out. So anyone who would like to be added to that mailing list, if they email us at walkenstownlibrary at dubbincity.ie or just phone the library library and we'll take your details and we we'll pop you on it just to keep in touch and then one last notice uh we have um it's called um dance for parkinson's just for the rest of bialtana it's uh, running on three weeks the 11th 18th and 25th which is the tuesdays from 11 11 45 and it's by artist alwyn lynn and basically it's gentle uh, dance and movement you know ballet yoga so anyone can join there's some places left if you want to get in touch with us about that so i just want to thank you all for joining us it has been a great pleasure a fantastic morning uh 100 30 people on zoom kathy so right. well done well done <laughs> and good luck with the rest all right okay and thank you all and keep in touch